Good evening, everybody. All right, let me just make sure that everything is working from a technical standpoint. Just want to check Instagram and then I will go ahead and introduce our guest. Hold on one minute. Okay, I think we're set. Hold on, let me see. Yes, awesome. Okay. Um, okay. So, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I think, let me just make sure we're on the parents group. Okay, there's some technical difficulties here today. Yeah, this would be the trickiest part for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we had some issues with this earlier today. Hold on just one minute and let me just check with my tech team to see if we are on. Um, okay. I don't think that we are on the parents group. So let me just, I'm going to post a link there. Oh, no, we are. Here we are. Okay, awesome. All right, so everything is set. Um, sorry, sometimes we need to check our <laughs> check. Okay. You're, You're right at nine a.m. So You're good. good. Um, all right, so um, welcome. Uh, just as we, you know, sort of are, you know, having people arrive. I just want to introduce myself, and I want to introduce um, our guests for tonight. I'm hoping that this will become you know, sort of a regular thing where I bring on other people, whether those are advisors here at MedEdits or whether they are, um, you know, people from the community, admissions committee members, um, people in medical education. Um, but for those of you who don't know me or who may be watching the recording, which we always post after these live Q and A's, my name is Dr. Jessica Friedman. I am the chair and founder of Med at its medical admissions. I'm an emergency physician. I'm a former medical school admissions committee member at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, a former residency admissions officer and some other things. And I founded Med at its more than 15 years ago. And we work with with a huge range of students helping them get to medical school residency fellowship. And I am joined tonight by Lori Tanzi. And Lori, I met at Mount Sinai when we both were working there. Um, and we met in the Department of Medical Education, um, you know, because I was working in the emergency department, but also spent some time on the education side of things. And Lori was the assistant dean of student affairs at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She was on the admissions committee. She also worked with the fourth year medical students there, helping them get into residency. And when I started MedEdits, I said to myself, if I ever uh, get to the point where I need additional faculty, if I need additional advisors, I just hope that Lori will be available to join me. Oh, so, thankfully, <laughs> so thankfully, she was when that time came. And she has been here with us at MedEdits for more than 10 years at this point. I can't believe it's that long. Yeah. <laughs> and so she, along, you know, uh, with me and, and the rest of our team, we have, you know, obviously seen a huge spectrum of students and held, helped a huge spectrum of students. And we have learned from all of you um, and all the students we've worked with so that our advice is always current and staying up to date with trends. So as um, I think most of you know who have been here before, I start these sessions by going over the questions that have been posted in our group. Um, and then I encourage everybody to post questions live um, and we will go ahead and answer those as well. So let me just start with this question um, and I actually will post it um, so everyone can see. Okay. If you want to let us know where you're joining us from, if you want to let us know um, what, um, sorry, here we go. If you want to let us know uh, where you are in the process or where your student is in the process, that would be terrific. It always, you know, offers, it's, it's always good for us to kind of understand who our audience is. So this is a bit of a big question. So, um, so um, John writes, my daughter will be applying to medical school this year. She is working as a nurse practitioner, worst technician, nurse technician in a hospital. She needs a reference from the hospital. 
What could be the problems with using her supervising nurse as her reference? I'm comfortable with this for she says that is the person that could speak to her experiences. What is your thought on this? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll answer this. So um, certainly if your daughter, first of all, is working as a nurse, tech, nurse technician, that is a great way to get clinical experience, hands-on clinical experience. And certainly if the immediate supervisor is the one who um, is the one who she is working the most closely with, then that is most definitely, I'm okay with her getting a letter of recommendation from that individual. It does not need to be a physician. Um, right, Laura, you agree with that? Oh, I absolutely agree. I think a lot of people get caught up in sort of a, a big name writing your letter. And honestly, at this stage, it's more about who knows you the best and who can really write you the strongest letter and who's really observed you. So, um, you know, medicine is a team sport. You need doctors, you need nurses, you need paramedics and, you know, other support players. So I think, you know, a nurse supervisor would be fantastic. Okay, awesome. I actually think we might be having some problems with the parent group. So let me, I'm just going to go ahead. Just give me one second, Lori. I apologize. Um, and I'm just going to post because um, we were having trouble with connecting to them. Okay. Um, for some reason, our software decided. You know what, Jess? While you're doing that, yeah. Dr. Jessica, sorry. <laughs> um, I can. Do you want me to pass along some upcoming double AMC sessions that I just noticed that would be amazing? Sure, absolutely. Uh, that would be terrific. Upcoming applicants. Yep. So the double AMC is the Association of American Medical Colleges. And I always direct students there because it's really the most accurate data. There's so much, you know, information on the internet now, and you really need to go to reliable sources. So they are having a um, series of upcoming webinars. The first one is on February 8th, and that one is about the preview exam. So it'll be all the nuts and bolts about taking the preview, which is their version of a situational judgment test. Um, there are maybe 10 to 15 schools that require the preview, so you may not need it, but you may. Um, and then on February 13th, they're doing an MCAT update session, so just kind of new information um, about this year's MCAT exam, I believe, uh, end of February, you can, um, access the registration for the next testing period. Um, and then on April 17th, this one's going to be really important is navigating the 2025 AMCAS application. So that's very helpful. It's a huge, long, tedious application. And if you can get kind of an overview from the double AMC that, would be helpful to you. So just wanted to pass along those couple of dates. Okay. Thank you so much, Laura. That's super, super useful. And so for those, um, you know, who don't know what a situational judgment test is, it's a test that many medical schools are now requiring um, for students as part of the process. Um, we don't really like calling it a test because it's not a test like the MCAT is a test. Um, the other very common situational judgment test that you may have heard of is called CASPER. And, you know, and so, um, Okay, I'm sorry. So we definitely are having some issues with the live <laughs> on our Facebook group. So um, so if you can all go to the main MedEdits page, which I posted on the parents group, that would be awesome. And I apologize for these complications. It's something with StreamYard, which is the service we use. And we thought we had fixed this earlier in the day, but I guess we didn't. So um, anyway, so um, and so for those of you who are just joining us, I do want to introduce again, Lori Tanzi. She is one of our advisors, one of our outstanding advisors. Um, she's at the professor level. And um, Lori, so I don't know, just for sort of the people who have just joined us, who are joining us, if you just want to kind of say a few words, that would be awesome. Sure. Nice to meet everybody. This is fun. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start with a little quick story. So my husband just had a, um, a hip replacement and it was done by one of my former students at Mount Sinai. So I mean, full circle moment. And he has been wonderful. So uh, it's been very interesting to kind of see the whole surgical experience from this side of it and how, all the new technology mm -hmm. and all the things they send you home with. Um, 
So anyway, I uh, love working with Dr. Jessica and Dr. Randy, and I've been here over 10 years. Yeah, Lori's been here a very a long time, and we've learned together. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, you know, we work as a team. And so that's one of the benefits that you do get when you work with us is that we sort of all, um, you know, kind of contribute our knowledge and our understanding, and we can bounce things off one another. Mm -hmm. um, so we are very much a collaborative team. So it's certainly one of the benefits. Yes. Um, so so let me let me look at another question. So Archana asks, what would you recommend taking 12 credits of courses during the summer at a community college to boost the GPA before applying? Do you want to take that or you want me to take it? Well, I guess it's always tough with just like a little snippet of information because I would really love to see what's going on more broadly for you, Archana. And are you talking about um, prerequisites or are you talking about like upper level science classes just to kind of, like you said, boost your GPA? Um, I would say you want to, if at all possible, take your coursework at a four-year college. Although I feel like after COVID things have relaxed a little bit in that regard, but I think if you can aim for that. Um, but yes, I would want a more full picture of your, of like what your transcript looks like and, and, and that kind of thing before giving you a more thorough answer. Yeah, ag agreed. So, so medical schools definitely accept community college credits. Um, and certainly there are some people who are going to start out at community colleges and then they enroll in, you know, for your undergraduate, um, you know, colleges or universities. You have to be careful taking too many credits at a community college. So it will potentially look a little suspect if you have gone from the undergraduate college and then you have, you know, switched over to, um, you know, a community college and suddenly your GPA skyrockets, right? That That is not necessarily going to look very good. Um, so, so you need to be careful sort of like, what was the GPA beforehand? What is the GPA at the community college? How much are you trying to boost it? Because the the transcript and you know where what courses you've taken, where you've taken those courses, um, that will definitely um, you know be reviewed very very carefully um, by a medical school admissions committee. So just kind of keep that in mind. Okay. Hi, Olivia. How are you? All right. Olivia asks, is there a certain number amount, I guess, of clinical volunteering hours recommended to have before applying to med school? So I can, I can jump in on this. Yeah. It's so interesting. We've noticed this. We, <laughs> these trends are all fascinating, but I think Jeff, you know where this started, I think, on some particular message board website or something, the number of hours. Yeah. And so now everybody's kind of fixated on like, oh, I have to have this certain mm -hmm. number that I must get to. Like the magic number, yeah. The magic, yes. <laughs> and it's really, I don't want students to think of it in terms of a number um, as more of kind of a level of competency, if you will, or level of comfort or a level of familiarity with the clinical environment? And have you seen enough and learned enough to know that this is really what you want to do? And, and you have that evidence to show them that, you know, I've been in these situations and I really understand the profession. Um, you know, having said that, you know, certainly you need more than like 10 hours or even 25. You need pretty significant um, clinical time spent in a clinical setting or time spent doing community service. Um, I mean, I think they like a well-rounded applicant. So, you know, you can volunteer in a non-clinical environment in some, you know, area that's a real passion for you. If you like, you know, serving meals to the homeless or whatever it is, that's great. But also you need to spend time in clinical environments to show them that, you know, you get it. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly, um, I would say just kind of adding on to this, every medical school wants to see involvement in the community. Like that to me is an absolute fundamental requirement for medical school. Um, how many hours you spend really sort of depends on what your, what your niche is. What is your specialty? You know, how are you sort of crafting your candidacy? And we don't like to necessarily think about sort of superficially crafting a candidacy. We like, like Lori mentioned, to, to 
discuss what are your interests? What are the things that you like to do? Because it's very, very important in this process that you have a very authentic candidacy. So for some students, they may literally have thousands of hours of volunteer work or clinical work or both, right? So it, it depends on sort of what your individual niche is going to be. And this is something that when we're working with our students, we're talking with them about where are your interests and, you know, and sort of what area of medicine at this moment in time interests you most. And can you take that, whatever that sort of specialty or discipline is, and how can you then sort of pursue that clinical or volunteer work to sort of um, kind of highlight or broaden your understanding of whatever that discipline is. Um, any other questions? I know that Lori, just because, you know, I, I know the questions we're getting um, from our own students at, at this mm -hmm. time, you know, everyone's asking us, you know, am I doomed? You know, if I, if I don't have any acceptances yet, does this mean I'm not getting into medical school? Um, you know, and so we certainly from our own students, um, you know, we do have, a few students, and it's sort of interesting, right? The students, and Lori, you can chime in if you feel this is, um, you're seeing the same trends, um, you know, but some of the students that don't um, have acceptances or don't have more than one acceptance are a lot of students who are applying and who've been interviewed at very high level schools because those schools tend to release all of their acceptances in bulk in March. So, you know, so sometimes it's sort of interesting that sometimes the most competitive applicants, you know, may have the least number of acceptances for that reason. Are you seeing any trends like that at all? Definitely. I mean, back when I started in this world, it was it was so different. I mean, students were it was all rolling. Everywhere was rolling and you, everything was timely and students were offered an acceptance or a wait list, you know, to a couple of weeks to a month after their interview. And now, I mean, I hate to say it, but they, the schools really are stringing the students along and they're also kind of playing this like cat and mouse, like, well, how much do you really want to come here? You know, so they'll sort of Mm -hmm. um, at some point in the process, maybe try to gauge that from the applicant. You know, if you want to stay on our wait list, we need you to fill this out mm -hmm. kind of thing. So it's, uh, there's just more and more layers to it. And um, yeah, it's really unfortunate because now students <coughs> may not really complete their process until April, right? May, I mean. Yeah even like a full year. it's a full yeah. year and that is it's so hard to wait in this yeah. sort of you know 2024 when everything is instantaneous yeah and it's it's tough um yeah i've had a lot of students that have just recently like this month january mm -hmm. gotten some additional interviews yeah. um so a lot of students by thanksgiving they're like you know, panicking. I don't have an interview. That's okay. Like <laughs> it's really okay. So, um, and again, you cannot compare yourself to your friend or your roommate who's going through the process. Everybody takes a very different, um, you know, route through this process. Um, but yeah, it, it's always interesting. And I think that is one thing we can really help with is kind of normalizing some of this stuff that's happening mm -hmm. to you and telling you, oh yeah, that's this is what's this is what's going on. We've seen this before. And and yeah. also we, you know, these are the trends for this year. I mean, just this week, um, you know, some students that Lori has um and that, you know, I sort of oversee everyone to a degree. Um, you know, we've had acceptances this week and we've had new interviews extended this week, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, things are still very much happening. Um, so if you if you don't have any acceptances at this point, but you've had interviews, that's very, very promising. If you are in a position where you don't have any interviews at all, um, then that's a time when we probably want to really look at your application to figure out if a reapplication is going to be necessary. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. OK. All right. Let me see. What are BSMD programs looking for in high school applicants? Um, BSMD programs are looking for essentially the same things in BSMD applicants as they are looking for in traditional medical school applicants. 
And our successful BSMD applicants are extremely high achieving. They all have research, I would say. Um, definitely, they all have research. They all have some type of clinical exposure. Obviously, this is going to be more difficult to get as a high school student. Many will be working as EMTs, um, you know, or at their local rescue squad will be shadowing physicians. Some may be doing some summer programs of different sorts. Um, but and they all excel academically with very high metrics, meaning taking the most rigorous high school course load in all five disciplines, um, scoring very high on their SAT or ACT, you know, BSMD applicants cannot and should not be test optional, um, as we sort of as the test optional world for college applicants is becoming more and more competitive. Um, but essentially, the BSMD applicants also need to be very, very mature and very focused. They need to be able to convince an admissions committee um, and during an interview that they know what it means to be a doctor and that they have really thought about this. Um, and they're not just sort of doing it because their parents have pressured them to do it, which is sometimes the case. Mm -hmm. I, can I just chime oh, in on the thing there? Mm -hmm. I would say, um, Christine, I'm not sure where you are in this whole process, but I've noticed, and this is something I'm going to be looking more into, that um, some schools are kind of dropping their BSMD in favor of an early assurance program. So yeah. that's when you apply during your sophomore or even beginning of your junior year of college. And so it's a way to retain the very high achieving kids on that undergraduate campus to stay on for med school. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, senior in high school trying to evaluate, you know, your whether you should be a doctor, it's so young. So at least, you know, sophomore in college, junior in college, there's a little more time to to know and to evolve and to develop. So if you're choosing a college and you're pretty sure about med school, you know, check and see they might have like an EAP um, for yeah. 10 to 15 of their highest achieving undergrads. It's worth looking into. Yeah, absolutely. Yas, Yas Rahman, who's one of our very loyal followers, thank you, just, um, you know, chimed in on the chat, you know, that SUNY Upstate just dropped their BSMD program this year. And it is interesting, you know, every year I feel like, you know, more of the early assurance programs are popping up. Um, early or EAP is early assurance program the longest standing one, which, you know, Lori and I are very familiar with, um, is the flex med program at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. But then many of the colleges now have these programs specifically for their undergraduates. So this mm -hmm. year, what we've worked with Tulane students, we've worked mm -hmm. with Tufts students. Georgetown has one. Right. Georgetown. Um, and so this is also something if, you know, depending on where you are in your education, you know, if you're looking at undergraduate colleges, I wouldn't use it as a deciding factor. But if you're considering various colleges and you know you want to be pre-med, you might want to think about which, you know, which undergraduate colleges have these EAPs. Um, and, you know, that could factor into your decision. Yeah, and some of this, there's some small um, like liberal arts schools that maybe have have it with like a pen or you know something. So right, um, definitely right. take a look. Like Princeton has one with pen, I know. Um, yeah, so they're they're you know, and they're they're not well advertised. There's no centralized right. database for these, as far as I know. And Yas also, Yas is terrific. Thank you. He also said Robert Wood Johnson has one. Um, I wonder, Yas, which undergraduate college is that is affiliated with? Because um, that one I'm not aware of. Are you, Laura? Do you know that one? You know, it's ringing a bell. Mm. I think it's maybe. Is it? It's Rutgers. It's Rutgers, I believe. Oh, um, it's a early yeah. appearance. Mm, didn't know. Yeah. Oh yeah, he says Rutgers, New Brunswick. Thank okay. you. All right, awesome. Yeah. So yeah, so you know, if you're like a Jersey resident, Rutgers is a great, great undergraduate college. Robert Wood Johnson, fabulous medical school. So yeah. this is why, as you're, um, as you're, you know, looking at your undergraduate colleges, you really want to be thinking about this. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is having a parent who is a physician helpful in the application process? <laughs> Let me know if you want me to. It depends on the relationship between the parent and the child. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Lynn. <laughs> I can tell you we work with a lot of, 
you know, physician students. Um, and, you know, it, it's amazing to me how many of my own peers from medical school, um, from residency are now coming out of the woodwork. Can you work with my students? Um, you know, because even though we all went to medical school, um, things have changed so very much since we applied. So even if you have a physician parent, um, that physician parent, you know, usually doesn't really know much about the process. It was a very long time ago. And, you know, for those of you who don't, you know, know, know what about medical education, medical training, there are so many steps, right? So by the time you're, you know, you've completed your residency application process, your residency training, your fellowship application process, then your attending application process, you know, med school's ancient history. So mm -hmm. um, I don't really think, honestly, that having a physician is very helpful in the process, a physician parent, but it's helpful in terms of, you know, obviously potentially, get, you know, having those connections, finding people to shadow, um, you know, from that standpoint, it probably can be very useful. Um, and depending on whether or not your parent is in an academic setting, you know, they can also find research for you and all of that. But, you know, in terms of helping with the actual process and in terms of, you know, let's say there being some type of nepotism in the process that that really doesn't happen um, in medicine the way it happens, I think, in other types of disciplines and professions. It's, I, I wish I had the statistic because I have seen it, but it's, it, there's a lot of applicants who are sons and daughters of physicians and it makes sense. Makes, makes sense, sense, right? It's all and, and applicants shouldn't hide that fact in their application. You know, they should talk about it. Um, the more authentic, the better. The more honest, the better. Oh. Yes, I'm sorry. She, I, I'm sorry if I misspoke. <laughs> Thank you for being yes. here. <laughs> Um, okay. Just, I don't know if you know the answer to this, Lori. No, I, I, but I'm going to find out now. I'm really curious. Yeah, Texas has um, APs. The TSAS is a great, they have their own thing going in Texas. So yeah. except yeah. for, um, Texas Christian TCU is the only Texas school that uses AMCAS. Yeah. Baylor yeah. used to, but now they don't. So Texas, you got to go to the TMD SAS yep. for all their info. I, I bet there are. There, there must be. There, yep. you know, Texas is a great state to be from when it comes to medical school admissions. Um, there are just so many programs, so many medical schools. Um, you know, Houston is the literally the largest medical center in the world. I was there just last week and literally you look at the skyline and it's just, you know, every, you know, well-known hospital that, you know, we've been hearing about our whole lives. It's just phenomenal. So if you're, if, if you're, if you're interested in medicine, you have to go visit Houston at some mm -hmm. point in your career because there's no city like it in terms of, um, you know, medicine and Rice, Rice University is literally right next to the medical center, you know, surrounded by all of these phenomenal institutions. So if it's that, you know, again, depending on where you are in your journey, you might want to think about Rice or UH, um, you know, any any of those Houston um, undergrads, they're fabulous. Or Baylor, right? A lot of, a lot of schools. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and growing by the year. Every yeah. year they're adding medical schools in Texas. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, let me just go back to the board. Any other questions at all? We are happy to answer them. So please post them. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to fix, you know, our technical difficulties for next week. Again, we thought we when we did our test run, which we always do, we thought we had them. We thought we had this all fixed. Um, okay, um, so here's a question. Are the prompts, this is a great question from Umesh. I'm gonna post it just so you all can see it. Um, okay, are the prompts for secondary essays the same from year to year? If not, how similar are they? They are quite identical from year to year. I mean, of course, a school might rotate one question out, add a different question. Um, but I would say, right, we've been seeing the same questions over and over for several years in a row. I'm kind of sick of them, to be honest. I hope they do change. Um, but um, yeah, they're, they're all available on our website. And if you just Google, you know, Northwestern Medical School secondary questions, you can, you can get them. Um, 
But yeah, yeah I would say they don't change drastically from year yeah. to year. Every once in a while, we're thrown a curveball and we work with students and we've done, all, you know, a large number of their secondary essays. And, you know, those prompts are released not until July. And suddenly, the, you know, one of those prompts has changed. It happens. But, you know, generally speaking, these prompts are not changing. I would say that the, probably the most reliable place to look for all these prompts is um, is going to be Reddit on the school specific discussion pages when all the students start posting what those prompts are for the year. Um, we try to keep our website up to date. Um, I'm sure there are others, but I, I find that, you know, going to the websites where students are posting about this in real time. And as soon as those prompts come out, students are posting what they are. That's probably the best way to kind of make sure that nothing has but that's changed. the only time you should be on Reddit. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Please stay off right now. She'll go down a deep, dark hole. <laughs> now, that's when we get the panicked phone calls and, and emails from everybody. Um, you know. Okay. Any other questions at all? Um, you're you're all you're all pretty quiet tonight. Usually we have a lot more questions. I'm just gonna post a few things um that I would like everyone to be aware of. First of all, if you are applying to medical school this year, um, I encourage you to download our new toolkit, which is going to help you stay organized. It's going to give you some worksheets. It's going to, you know, sort of give you some ideas as you apply to medical school that hopefully will, you know, help you to put forth a terrific application. I'm also going to give you um, a link to our web, our webinar that I did last year. Um, I would like to do a, another webinar that's more up to date, but I do think that everything in this webinar is still relevant. Um, to this year, and it would be very, very helpful for everybody. And finally, if you are interested in talking to us, learning about us, you know, if you have any questions about your candidacy, sign up for a free 15 minute consultation if you haven't done that already. Um, and for those of you who are not a part of our parents group, um, and it's really for parents and pre-meds. Anybody who wants to join um, can, you know, can join us on Facebook and we will be getting, uh, you know, this linkage. We haven't had, ever had, had a problem with this until this week, which is very, very strange. And we had it fixed this morning. But um, this is a link to our private Facebook group for those of you who want to join that. Um, okay. Tanya asks, if an undergrad school does not have pre-med advisors for students, is that okay? It's yeah, okay. I mean, <laughs> it's too bad. Um, it's why we exist. Um, mm -hmm. because even schools that do have pre-med advising, sometimes that pre-med advising is inadequate. You know, pre-med advisors, in, in all fairness, uh, you know, they have a lot of students that they need to um, attend to. Um, you know, they sometimes have very little to no training, to no experience in medical school admissions, um, you know, and they are sort of thrown, you know, thrown to the students who sort of expect them to be all knowing. Um, so I would say it's a hard job, honestly. Um, so but if your school does not have pre-med advising, absolutely, that's OK. This also means that your school does not have a pre-med committee letter. Not all schools right. do have pre-med committee letters. You are only expected to have a pre-med committee letter if your school offers it. So I, I would not stress about this. But go, but Tanya, do make sure you're using reliable resources when you're looking for information since you're sort of on your own. Um, and I said this earlier, but the AAMC, the AAMC.org, they've got the most reliable data. They have the medical school admissions requirements. Um, it's a booklet, but it's also all the school's informa admissions information. That is extremely, extremely helpful. They've got information on everything from, you know, taking the MCAT to filling out the AMCAS application to doing um, your CASPER or preview, which is kind of another step in this process, uh, like a situational judgment assessment. So I would direct you toward um, the AAMC and also to our MedEdits um, blog where we have lots of articles on different topics. Yeah, yeah. I, I just posted a link to, to the MCAR. 
Oh, Stony Brook. Interesting. So Tanya says Stony Brook is the school that doesn't have a pre-med advisor, which is interesting because Stony Brook is such an outstanding school it is. When it comes to STEM that that's a little surprising to me. Yeah. yeah. Honestly. Mm, interesting. Um, I, Lori, I don't, I don't know. You no, know, I'm thinking this is the, um, the choose your medical school tool when it oh, starts. Yes. I think that's what, um, okay. So, yeah, so Brigido asks, I've heard February 19th is an important milestone for the medical school admissions process. Is that right? What it's is not that important, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you want to explain what it is, uh, you know. So choose, choose your medical school tool is um, something the AAMC, frankly, I think it sort of complicates this process a little bit, but the, their intentions were good. What they, what they did with this tool is they, they no longer gave medical school admissions offices the admissions information on their applicants. So no longer can the medical school see that Jessica Friedman, oh, look, she's also been accepted at Penn and U Chicago. Well, you know, so no, they're, they're doing it to kind of protect the students. Um, so now this choose your medical school tool allows the applicant to say, I'm planning to enroll or I'm committing to enroll. But February 19th is just when it kind of opens. I would say the big deadline is April 30th. That's when you can only hold one acceptance. You can stay on wait lists, but you can only hold one acceptance. Um, there's a lot more I could say about this, but yes, you can look at it on the AAMC website or message us and we can. In other words, do not stress about this yeah. at all. We get yeah. so many questions about this. <laughs> um, yeah. And I can tell you that the vast majority of students at this point are not sure of where they're going to medical school. No. They're still thinking. Right. Yeah. Day, right. For many, for I, I'd say for like all of our students, that's the case. Most mm -hmm. the vast majority. Okay. What is the most common way for college freshmen to become an EMT? Um, a lot of undergraduate colleges have their own EMT um, services. So if the student's college has an EM, EMS or EMT service, they can often do that through their undergraduate college. Um, otherwise, if the undergraduate college doesn't offer that, and usually that's a very, very competitive position to get because all the pre-meds want it, mm -hmm. um, then this is something that you could get training in the community. Um, it's offered, you know, if you just sort of, you know, Google, you know, EMT training mm -hmm. in, let's say you're at Lehigh, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, you know, you're going to be able to find that um, in the community and you'll have to kind of work that into your schedule. Mm -hmm. And working as an EMT is a great way to get clinical experience. Certainly. Yeah, it is. Um, okay. Is it possible to sign up for multiple dates for the MCAT? My son doesn't have his summer plans yet, so he wants to sign up for more than one different location for the same or consecutive days. Is this doable? The MCAT only lets you sign up for one. But you can change your date. You can change it. As your plans change. You can change your date. You can only sign up for one at at, a, at an individual time. So you yeah. can't sort of hold multiple spots. Right. And I would just kind of, this is a little bit of a different topic, but I think it's important. I think students get very locked into, I have to take the MCAT on, you know, March 15th, because that's when I signed up to take it. Mm -hmm. you and please don't take it if you're not ready. You can change your date. You can push it back. And please do that. You don't want to um, take this test until you're ready. Yes. This is something we always emphasize to our students. You ideally, you want to go into the MCAT um, as prepared as you possibly can be. You ideally want to take it once. If you must take it twice, that's perfectly fine. We start getting a little nervous when students are moving into the third exam. Okay, it's a good question. Sheetal asks, my son is going to USC in California. He wants to take his physics class in the summer at a community college. Does this look bad on medical school applications? We touched on this before a little bit. I, 
I don't think this is ideal to be, you just never want to look like you're avoiding sort of, a, you know, a prereq that's maybe kind of difficult. And so you're going to go take it somewhere else. I mean, he, he could, um, if, but again, most kids are now students, applicants taking, um, the gap, I, I, the gap year, we call it, I guess that's what makes the most sense, but you know, there's no rush to get through college. They uh, admissions committees honestly want a student who's had time to sort of reach their full, you know, potential maturity, et cetera. So I wouldn't feel like you have to cram in, you know, a summer physics class. Again, I don't know the whole situation here, but um, I don't know. That's what I would say. I, I would say um, we would need to look at the big picture. I think taking you know, if, if this is sort of necessary, um, especially at a huge school like USC, where I think just based on people I know who go there, some of our students I know who go there, um, I think sometimes scheduling can be a little complicated potentially. So I think that if this is necessary in order to fit everything in, to fit in the MCAT, to fit in the experiences, and the rest of the profile is excellent. And it isn't like the students doing this in order to sort of just get a high grade and boost the GPA. And we talked about this earlier about using community college to boost a GPA and how that's probably not the most advisable thing. So I would say that if this is an outlier and it's an if it's an individual instance where they're taking this at a local community college because that works best for them logistically and everything else is where it needs to be, it probably is okay. But like Lori said, we would need to see the big, the big picture before recommending a student do that. Um, okay, do undergrad students that have a medical school get any preference for med school, specifically asking for the University of California? Everyone wants to go to California. <laughs> UCs are so tough. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think what it sounds like you're asking is if you go to UCSD undergrad and you're applying there for med school, are you getting a preference at that school? Um, uh, you know, it's hard to know. I think you're kind of a known entity at your school. Presumably, if you've done some research or some shadowing and, and those people that you've worked with happen to be part of the admissions world a little bit. Um, so I think, you know, they they'll they'll want to keep their their best, of course. Um, and I think they do try to give a lot, give their students the opportunity to interview if you've met a certain threshold in terms of, you know, GPA, MCAT and some other major activities, clinical and research probably. Um, but I don't think, I don't know, it's, it's a pretty interesting question because every medical school does things a little bit differently. Right, right. So it's an interesting question, you know, sort of if we go back to like our EIP question, right? So like, for example, like a school like Tufts, I wonder, are they taking all of their own undergraduates as part of the EAP? And then in the regular in the regular process, are they taking any of their own undergrads? I bring that up just because I thought about that, right? right. Um, you know, but like Lori said, it isn't so much that they're going to give preference to their own students. It's that if you are a student at that undergraduate university, specifically UC, it's about the connections you make and the impact you make while you are there. So like, let's say you're involved in some really amazing research, you've made some phenomenal contributions and that principal investigator would love for you to stay on for the next four years while you're a student, they're going to call the admissions office and express that to them. So it's it's more about the connections that you're making that are going to help to give you an advantage at that university that has an affiliated medical school, mm -hmm. I think, but not, yeah. Well, and then that kind of begs the question, like the Tufts example, mm -hmm. How much space is left in their class for the yeah. regular old, you know, kids just applying there? Mm -hmm. I, I do because there are a lot of programs that you know these special masters programs mm -hmm. are feeding into um, the med schools too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and we don't know that data yet. I mean that that should be on the MSAR, right? But like, but I it's don't really not teased out well. It's not, yeah, it's you not. Have to, yeah, you have to kind of mm -hmm. know that there's that program and know how many kids. Yeah. Yes. 
And like I said, so many of these EAPs are sort of really under the radar. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's kind of impossible, right? I mean, mm -hmm. to know all of them that exist because the only students who find out about these programs are the students who are at that college or that university. So mm -hmm. they're not widely advertised. And even their applications are very, very well hidden. So like, when we've been working with students and you know we've been trying to find the applications, mm -hmm. only the students have access to those applications and have those links. So we have to get them directly from the students. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, this was a great conversation. It's 8.45, so I think we're going to end for tonight, but I hope that Lori will come back and join us again. Again, yes. for those of you- I will. You know, these are a lot of fun. I told her they're fun. Um, you know, for those of you who don't, um, who have chimed in late, and just so I can, you know, introduce Lori again, she is one of our faculty members, one of our advisors who've been who have been with us. She's been with us for more than ten years. I met Lori when I was on faculty at Sinai at the Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai, and she was there on faculty as well. And I really hoped that someday I'd be able to bring her on to work with us. And um, she has now been with us for more than ten years. So, um, so. So we, we've really enjoyed talking to all of you. And for those of you who don't know me, if you're meeting me for the first time, my name is Dr. Jessica Friedman. I am the chair and founder of MedEdit's Medical Admissions. But th this was a lot of fun. It was. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. We thank you all for tuning in. We hope to see you next week. Um, have a terrific weekend. And thank you all for your terrific questions. Right. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.